I'm not one of those filmmakers who looks at my own work and is like, "Oh, wow, man, I just nailed it. It's amazing." Every time like I said, my friends and I hung out and we drink a little bit and we like, "Man, I want to do something with films." So I Hyderabad Blues was shot in 17 days. Yeah, I mean, you can't go out prepared for that, yeah. We would just go bum 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 my okay. But I was shooting all masters huh? while I sleep and the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I write. And I also have a stupid rule. If I can finish a script in 30 days, I go to it. If I can't finish in 30 days, I just leave it. Are you a loser? Are you a freak? Do you need a lover? Don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. Don't bother me. Welcome to Real Struggles. We talk to real filmmakers and actors about their struggles working in the chaotic world of films. Today, our guest is writer, director, actor. Engineer Nagesh Kukunur, producer. Producer. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, you started uh, with like your acting workshops a few years before that, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, I actually uh, studied acting far longer than I did uh, anything with directing or writing. The only point of reference was a uh, one-week workshop that I did up in Maine, which taught me a little bit about TV production and stuff like that. But uh, Yeah, so I studied acting at this place called Warehouse Actors Theater in Atlanta. I think once I started studying acting it became apparent to me that I didn't want to just be an actor. I clearly wanted to be more in control of the medium. I wanted to be a director, so I think that's when it became clear. But what kind of like made you want to like did you have a thing for films and acting and anything before you went to the US or were you exposed to cinema over there? The kind of cinema you like? No, uh I think this uh, you know the classic cry wolf thing but uh, I always spoke about wanting to be a filmmaker or doing something with films and it usually surfaced after we started drinking and this was in college I'd say between 17 and 21 is when it was fairly clear that I wanted to do something with films and this was uh, during uh, when I was actually studying to be an engineer So this was at the peak of you know doing what you're supposed to be doing for the rest of your life when you're actually thinking about doing something else all the time. I was doing my chemical engineering here in uh, Usmania, but every time like I said my friends and I hung out and we'd drink a little bit and we like man I want to do something with films so I what it was I specifically didn't know but like what did drew you to films you didn't kind of put I I think you know there's uh, you know a lot of times when musicians make music and when you ask them there's no clear answer it's not like an epiphany at one point in your life you wake up and you say but I've always believed that you're wired to do something like from the core from the bottom of your heart something that you're meant to do I don't know that might be a little dramatic but I think it was films I think it was storytelling and that's not getting very deep or philosophical but uh, filmmaking is one of the most powerful forms of storytelling but I think I always wanted to tell stories and that clearly took root found a sort of space when we got a VCR mm. in 1985 my dad got a VCR and then my world just exploded because that was the time when you know the vhs tapes were the video tape was yeah movies and moved home correct and there was a boom it first started with video parlors here in hyderabad i'm sure you've heard those tales where you know you paid money and there was there was a guy who had a store where he sold cool drinks and some vegetable curry puffs and stuff like that and you could sit and watch a movie there yeah and oh. so he <laughs> it was like a mini theater of sorts okay so he would say these these were called video parlors and mm-hmm. some of them were shady too because they showed blue films and that's probably where they got most of their money from <laughs> exactly <laughs> so they would you know if you went to a place you'd know that evil dead mm-hmm. sam raimi's horror film which was one of the most iconic horror films is one of the most iconic horror films of all time that was only shown in video parlors that's where i went and saw it for the first time so wait you you saw evil dead back then like Yeah, when Evil Dead first came out. Okay. Yeah. So because a lot of people I've spoken to kind of grew up in the same era like the access to movies was so limited like they were only exposed to like Charles Bronson, Clint Eastwood. Yes, 
But if you had a good video library, hmm. and there was this video library called Maheshwari, which was legendary in Hyderabad, uh, this guy got pirated tapes from primary market was the American uh, market for sure, uh, but he got tapes from everywhere. And uh, I remember if you actually broke it down for that three year period, I averaged at the very least a film a day. And it was all a steady diet of American cinema, both the mainstream Hollywood, uh, you know, blockbusters to the independent films. And and that's where my roots are from. But do you think you still watch as many films as you do? Because every filmmaker, once they get into filmmaking, they just stop watching movies for some reason. They don't watch as much as they used to, at least. These last few years is when it's actually come down. Otherwise... The answer is yes, I do watch as many films as I used to back then. Um, it's still the way that I unwind at the end of a long day. Depends on my mood, the kind of film I want to watch, but I still do. I still do. And back then, it was a window to a world, right? Uh, the world that I wanted to enter. Now it's different. Now I'm part of that world. So there is that loss of innocence. There is that loss of genuine discovery. But every once in a while, you'll find mm. a film or you'll find a show that just blows you away. And that still happens. But in terms of what your taste and what you write and what you make, is there a... you? I mean, you have to write something that you'd want to watch. Otherwise, if you're not your own audience, who are you making the film for? But do you find that difficult when you're working with a production to who come who tell you that this is a story that needs to be told? How do you step away and make it a story that can be something that you'd want to watch? I don't know about making something that I want to watch. I for sure know that whatever I make, it's something that I believe in. Because I'm not one of those filmmakers who looks at my own work and is like, oh, wow, man, I just nailed it. It's amazing. As a matter of fact, I, I can't watch my own stuff because I can only see the mistakes, right? When you yeah. spend, you know, a year or two doing something, then it's very hard to... Divorce the mistakes because you were there on set, you were there in the edit studio while the music was being recorded. So uh, I don't watch my own stuff, but my belief in what I make, it's a thousand percent. There's no doubt about that. And I've never been put in a situation where I've made something that... That you didn't believe in. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, also if you were like, if someone sits with you when they watch a movie, if, you, if you're watching your own movie, I'm sure they'll also know all the mistakes. <laughs> you react very, <laughs> your reactions are very clear. Exactly. See, when you're on set, right, it's, it's such a heightened emotional state for anyone who's been making films, videos, ads, TV shows, it doesn't matter. If you truly believe in what you do, then... You're going to be revved up to a hundred every time you're doing something. At least that's the kind of environment I create around me on my set. Because I don't think there's any other reason you should be there. If the belief that madness is not there to that level. I've always told myself that if ever one reaches that stage where you're like, okay, another day, another dollar, let's go to the bloody set and do something. I hope I recognize those signs enough and quit. Because it has to be, let's go create some magic today. It has to be that. I mean, even if you're doing a 10-episode web series, it has to be that madness. And over there, I think with longer format, it gets even harder to kind of keep your... It does. Levels at the same from day one to day 60 of a shoot, right? It does, but you've been with me on set, so yeah. you know I can keep it. Yeah, while the rest of us <laughs> are just like withering away. Like he's at four in the morning, he's running up and down. He just, <laughs> and all of us are younger than you, and it's quite embarrassing to be on your set <laughs> that way. No, but, um, but sir, no, sorry, how do you get the conviction though? Like, for example, now when you're writing something, is there a list of questions that you need to know beforehand? How do you address, how, like, how do you go on set knowing that, okay, I'm convinced that today I know what I'm shooting. I know the story I want to tell. How do you not, how do you find the loopholes? How do you? I don't know if it's an advantage. Um, I consider it an advantage because I write my own material, right? There are some directors who might consider that a disadvantage because you're getting only one point of view right but 
and there's no right and wrong in this business. How you arrive at the final product is all that matters. Yeah, no one right? cares how no you make the film. Exactly, exactly. Because I write my own material, a lot of the conviction, the doubt, everything gets handled at that stage. And what emerges when I'm ready to shoot uh, comes with no doubt. Mm. By the time I'm ready to shoot, it's only a matter of execution. And anyone who's been on a set, you know, many times, you know that just execution is going to take the piss out of you. Just yeah. execution is going to take every ounce of your energy, right? If you bring in at that stage, oh, let me ideate, let me think, let me bring in self-doubt, that's death. Mm -hmm. So I remember way back when I was starting out, I read this thing about Hitchcock said that set is only about doing. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe in that too because all this thinking, actors asking, you know, what my motivation is, stuff like that. I very seldom face it on my set. Um, it's not that actors will explore scenes in different ways and we'll have discussions, but there's no confusion about the direction that we need to head in because I've spent, what, four, six months writing this. So the amount of self-doubt that happens, happens at that stage. And then what comes out? I always say this, and I don't know if it's uh, useful to any filmmaker, but I always say this, that you have to prepare so much that you have to be ready to change on, on a dime. And ironically, only preparation will allow that. Yeah. So you don't have to prepare so much that you have to be wedded to what you're going to do. And then you refuse to change on set. And this is my way or the highway. I don't do that. I'll still engage with the actors. I'll still try and find a different thing. Of course, keeping the overall, uh, the theme, you know, the direction I'm not going to lose. But yeah, each of the scenes can play many different ways, but it all comes from prep. But have you ever like encountered like uh, I, I, it hasn't happened when we've uh, been on any other films I've worked with you on a projects I've worked with you on but has this ever happened where you've gone in because you also quite meticulous about your short breakdown and what you want to how you want to tell the scene and even in fact the edit order is the way you write your short breakdown so when you go on set and then you're shooting the scene and it's completely just not been what you wanted and at that time how, how do you problem solve when you're stuck with, okay, I've committed five hours to this and I don't think it's what I want anymore. I, I will tell you for sure that it gets better with practice. Um, it takes, I'll go back to what I just answered in the previous question. When you prepare well and hard enough and long enough, then you will have the ability to make changes that allow you to incorporate all of that and still not lose track of the main thing. But that only comes from prep. Experience will teach you not to get flustered. Let's say, but I've never reached a point after five hours and said, okay. This you was... identified much earlier on. Exactly. You start identifying the problems early because it comes from all the prep, right? You, you've you done your prep and you're like, okay, this thing is heading in the wrong direction. We need to step back. I always get, I mean, you know, there will be those bad days. There will be those bad days. And I always say it's like uh, wading through quicksand. Not that I waded through quicksand, but it's like everything moves slowly. Your brain moves slowly. You can't find solutions to, uh, you know, fix things uh, with the way a scene is going. All those happen. But the prep is the... I keep coming back to the prep. I never show up to a set without prepping. I never come with the arrogance of, oh, I've been doing it for 25 years. I just, <laughs> I read the scene like multiple amount of times. I read the scene again on the way to the set. So, and that's why, again, you've been with me. I shoot fast because of the prep. And also like what one more thing I've noticed is we don't do many readings with the actors. We just sit with them twice and once they catch it, they catch it. And then yeah. it kind of sticks through the whole film. Like for having this kind of meticulous prep, like you must have had like disasters in earlier films to like be able to come up with this pro like system that works for you, right? See, one of the most useful things that I brought to the table as a filmmaker is the fact that I was an engineer. So with a math and a science background, you get that kind of putting everything in boxes, being a little more analytical, less emotional. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. engineering allows you to do that. 
or I won't say allows you to do that, forces you to do that. So I think that many years as an engineer taught me, gave me the right set of tools to be able to, you know, carry it into filmmaking. But one of the things that when I came to make Hyderabad Blues, everything was just laid out in little boxes, okay? And again, it was only about shooting it. It was not about ideating it. I was I was working with non-actors. It was, you know, family and friends were helping, crewing up and, you know, we were doing mm -hmm. all those things. So I knew that I would not have this whole thing of, oh, okay, let's see how we go. No, it was never that. So I would visit, everything was shot on real location. So I would go back. I would keep visiting the same sets. When you worked with me on a film versus when you worked with me on a show, that's the difference. When I'm working on a film, I keep visiting the place that yeah. I'm going to shoot at many times. Mm -hmm. So I literally plan my camera angles. Every recce you're there. Every recce I'm mm -hmm. there. I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, even if I've done some storyboarding, I'll immediately change it based on mm -hmm. having seen the location. So all these things help. So to answer your question, I've never had any disasters. Like from Hyderabad Blues, you were prepped. Hyderabad Blues was shot in 17 days. Yeah, I mean, you can't go unprepared for that, yeah. So we would just go, boom, 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 okay. But I was shooting all masters, huh? Yeah, I, 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 the virtu... shot is mainly wide shots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was virtually not shooting any close-ups or coverage. But I consider that more smart filmmaking than anything else. And, you know, sometimes it's my ally, sometimes it's not. Hmm. I knew that I had this much money and I had to execute a film in that and that's what I did. So when your short breakdown was done, did you have like at least three shots or did you just ended up only planning, okay, master and we'll see if we need more coverage. How did that go? No, I, I did have in a couple of the instances, like there are a lot of scenes that, you know, Ashwini and I are just sitting and talking that's a lead female character and I knew. So I was like a white, quickly knock the master off, close, close, mm. done. I, I knew the basics like that, but if I had five, six people, you see in the film that I just shoot masters. And with some, I was clever enough, but my mind was just opening up, right? Even yeah. as a filmmaker. I'm, I mean, there's a big difference between Rockford and Hyderabad yeah. Blues in terms of, I mean, even scale is obviously a lot bigger, but even the, like, it, it was like uh, you learned on Hyderabad Blues and then you kind of like... Absolutely, absolutely. And in Rockford, there is a little more maturity in, uh, in terms of what the director was doing, in terms of the short breakdown yeah, mm -hmm. it's a never-ending process. It's not a cliche. I always, I mean, no matter how many times you do it, you always discover something new. You know, maybe an actor brings something to the table. Then it's it's a joyous process. So when you're writing something now, does uh do you have like a a process for when it when you're writing? Do you like do beat sheets first? Do you have a log line? Do you ha just have the ending in mind? Like, I mean, like, there's so many different ways. Like, like Sid Field has, like, the three-act structure. Then you have other people who say, no, you need these 15 beats. Then you have people saying you need 40 scenes and that's your story. Like, what is your so, method to writing? So when I wrote initially, I was a serious student of Sid Field. I needed my three-act structure. Inciting incident. Yeah, I needed the pinches in each of the acts and all of those things. And after I finished the screenplay, I would again do, I think he had a Sid Field workbook or something. Yeah, something yeah, yeah, like he that. has a workbook, yeah. Yeah, that you could apply, Correct. you know, you would take your screenplay. Every chapter and, has a different activity at the end to do for your screenplay. To test your yeah. screenplay. Yeah, so I did that a couple of times and stuff like that. So I, I clearly followed that, without a doubt. But the writing just came with no clear plan. So once the writing was done, then I would say, oh, do I have a three-act structure? Mm -hmm. do, am I? But usually when I begin to write anything, let's talk about films, which are mm. very different from shows. Yeah. And I have a reasonable idea about the end. Tindivare is a classic example of how the ending comes completely changed from what I had intended. So it's, these things happen, but I sort of know where I want to go. And then the rest of the writing is discovery. You keep discovering things. I might say that, okay, in, in this space, and back in the day, again, I used to keep uh, cards. I would just write, uh, this scene is where, you know, Varun and Ashwini fight. 
maybe make a note that in the fight they're going to address this uh, little bit which is a cultural difference something like that right. make a quick note and that card is ready and then i remember you know they talk about uh, playing uh, with the cards like a jigsaw puzzle they yeah, are organizing and so i did all of those things in the early uh, days but now almost all the writing is instinctual so you at at no point you do you like step back writer synopsis first and then try and apply that it just that that right. doesn't work for you that's the worst that is the absolute do you think that kind of like holds you and like restrains you as a writer i don't know what the value of that is hmm. um primarily because that's not the final product right that much you'd agree yeah the final product is a screenplay right how you arrive at that screenplay is your business you might want a synopsis you might want be a beat sheet you might want all this and then okay first act i'm going to do this this is where i find all that a waste of time i feel as i keep writing and i keep discovering that process is so joyous and enjoyable that if i need to come back to any of these i'll come back to it later mm-hmm. i mean like i told you just a little while ago i did my homework according to the sidfield three act structure that's how my i probably trained my brain to think when i first started out but after that uh uh-huh. uh after you've kind of like figured out your I, method you yeah once i figured out my method now i even not now it's been at least more than a decade since i even stopped writing cards i i just start writing but i always carry a script book with me even now and i'll keep jotting ideas down and something pops in your head and you make a note i make a note don't know where it'll land might not land mm. uh, one of the random examples i'm just throwing out there was uh door and i i remember i was on a flight and i just wrote they should dance to the song kajrare on the dunes mm. that's what i wrote and it's one of the more iconic moments yeah. of the film and that's what i had done it's just oh okay that's a good idea so so the script book of mine is like the most important i mean earlier on like i'm sure like even uh, when you first did, uh, did a early draft of hyderabad blues do you show it to people to get feedback on it or and now do you do that as well like what what level do you start getting asking people to read it or do you not do you just like <laughs> go straight to the producers and so i when i wrote hyderabad blues the way the story goes is i quit my job I gave up everything came here to quote unquote get into films this is the 10 second version nothing works out here because i go to the set of something that's being shot in anupurna studios actually and i was horrified by what i saw on set <laughs> and i was like oh my god if this is the industry i've come to get into i'm going to die i mean there's no way i'm doing this so i quit my job so i was here in hyderabad for about 3 months during that period i sat and i wrote hyderabad blues i literally locked myself in a room barely coming out to have a meal shower and everything and i wrote the whole script longhand so once i wrote it i didn't even know what i wrote so obviously i had to test it so i took it back and i had a reading of that with my acting class i went back to atlanta and mm-hmm. i had a reading with my acting class and they seemed to like it so i was like okay so i think i'm on the right track mm-hmm. and that was it and i was show my scripts to anyone the only person once i started trusting her and the process who would get to read my finished script was elahe mm. and you know once she started producing with me yeah then i got into the comfort zone so if i took anyone's feedback it was elahe's okay so i would give her the finished script and uh, what i liked best about her process it was the opposite of mine it was very visceral she would say oh i loved it mm. or um it was good but you know there were some parts that you know it was it was just like broad strokes and you know as she got better at the the so, job of producing yeah then she also would give more specific feedback but she is the only person that i ever allowed anyone to read and i would say that even after what she would point out hmm. only if you were convinced by it and the changes and sometimes the points were fabulous but the changes would amount to maybe 10 20% hmm. on the higher side otherwise most of the script remained intact 
So do you even read your scripts as an actor would like when you're when you've written a scene out, would you like read the lines out and try and play how the scene would play? No, no. You, you wouldn't do that because you also are a actor, right? So like <laughs> would you apply that into your writing in a way? I think I do it uh, I I'm pretty sure I do it at a subconscious level. Because for sure, you know, when I'm in the throes of writing a scene, right? And I think a lot of the stuff that I enjoy writing are dramatic scenes between, you know, two, three different characters. When I'm doing that, I know for a fact, I'm, I've I've caught myself mouthing the lines loudly when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And you, because you want to get that out onto the paper before you lose the train. So I've, I've, I've done that, but no, no. Not like a conscious activity. No, no. I um, I write it. I everything just blah, comes out. Then I let it rest for a little while, uh, sometimes a week or two weeks. Then I come back to it, and just quietly I will I will try. I'll, I I still do it the old-fashioned way. I print a hard copy, and I go to some quiet place if I can go out of town. Nothing like it, and I'll just read it, just read it, and I'll make notes. Then I'll come back and then I'll finish my. Final draft. Is there anything like overwriting for you? Do you like go into like nine drafts, like maybe one more draft? Because every time you read, you're going to find something that maybe this. I agree. I agree. And sometimes the overwriting has happened. It. Uh, I. I would be lying if I say I didn't. Sometimes it does, but usually it's scripts that aren't working the first time around that require so much rewriting, because the scripts that work the first time the very first draft oh. all 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 the ones that i've written i forget the number of days i'm sure i made a note somewhere but you know um, Iqbal was written in like five days or seven days or something like that and door, like your first draft yeah door was about that long seven days ten days and these days are like how long are you writing eight nine hours i do about eight nine hours yeah and uh Hyderabad Blues itself, I think, was written in seven days. Longhand. Mm. My hands were just cramping, pencils just breaking, and just writing like a maniac. So, yeah, usually something that comes out with that kind of focus and force, usually I've not had to do much with it. So, like, but, yeah, like, at least for me, when I'm writing my first draft, it feels like a vomit draft. Like, I've just vomited all my ideas onto paper. After that, I find it hard to go back to the script without like over dissecting it. Okay. See, I I'll be perfectly honest with you. I it's not that I've not answered questions on writing hmm. uh, many times in my career, but I've not had this. Yes, writer's block, bad days. Yes, 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 yes. But like I've always said, the answer somewhere here is just bouncing around. You hmm. just need to pull it out. It's gotten much more complicated as I've gotten into the OTT space because the last six years I've been making shows. That's why I have another writer with me and then we bounce ideas off and every time I get stuck, he pulls me out and I'd like to think I do the same when he does as well. But with films, it's always been a solo process. So I know the answers in here somewhere. I have to just like sometimes beat it out, sometimes ease it out, but it'll, it'll come. And once instinctually I feel it's there, and it's right, I'm done. I don't question myself. See, also the advantage is I never gave my scripts out to get an opinion from anyone. Mm. So, right or wrong, I'm going to live by what I wrote. Yeah. And that's that. How important is the routine for you though, for your writing? Because I know you write every day practically, right? Even if it's like, I'm sure you have hundreds of scripts that are just <laughs> lying there with you, which probably you'll never see the light of day just I in know, your man. computer. R ritual, routine, very important. Very, very important. As I've gotten older and as I've been writing more, it's very clear that I let the ideas percolate and cook while I sleep. Hmm. And the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I write. So if you're writing, on, so writing something right now and that day you're not feeling that project, would you just start something else and just like write just so, the, just so that you have something no. to write? No. Or you just stick to what you've already started? You beat that thing out of you. Because I think that's a tough thing writers struggle with finishing what they've started, right? I do have several unfinished scripts. But that was also during a time where I was writing a lot of just spec scripts, right? Okay, this mm -hmm. is what I want to write. Let me see what happens. Oh, I want to make this. Oh, okay, great. Let me write it. 
and I also have a stupid rule. If I can finish a script in 30 days, I go to it. If I can't finish in 30 days, I just leave it. I might come back to it much later when, again, I'm feeling it. Mm. But 30 days is when I'm going to give that script. I'm not going to write other stuff. I'm just going to be on it. That kind of discipline I've forced myself to have. As a director, like do you, uh, so David Mamet in his book, uh, I know he's one of your favorite directors. Uh, he says, uh, directors have two jobs. You tell the actor what to do and you know where to place a camera. Tell the DOP where to place a camera. <laughs> How much of that do you agree with? That's pretty much the basics of direction. I always tell people that uh, 80% of direction is being able to organize and communicate with people. That's 80% of direction. This, see, I'm not, why I agree so much with Mamet is people like him and I are not a Ridley Scott or James Cameron. Mm. These people are incredibly visual where the camera is doing lots of amazing things. Mm -hmm. Mine is a lot more straightforward process of storytelling. I like to, you know, focus on the emotional quotient of what the material brings to the table. Yeah, I, I, even I throw in my creativity, moving the camera around and all that, but that's not my central focus. So, yes, you tell the DOP, but once you get used to working with a certain DOP, then you find this lovely synergy. When I begin the scene, I'm doing the breakdown, and uh, let me tell you, every time it's an out-of-body experience. Like, what I've finished most recently... Trail of an Assassin, which is, you know, the hunt for Rajiv Gandhi's killers. Three months later, when I look at footage of myself directing on set, it feels like someone else was doing the work. So it's like this... Complete out-of-body experience. Yeah. This possessed space that I get into. And there you can see me actively interacting with the DOP saying, okay, see, the way I'm looking at this scene is the camera kind of, we set up a dolly, we come in from here... And I see those two actors are there and, the, you know, he walks across and maybe ends up close to the camera. Then I'm going to do coverage with, you know, I'll do all of these things. But once the DOP and I find the vibe, a lot of times he'll say, this is not such a good angle, sir. How about we look at, oh, never thought of that. And boom, I'm good to go. I do the same with actors. When I bring them in and I tell them, okay, just rehearse the scene. I'm not going to raise the scene. I'm giving you the setup. The camera is coming here. Ta -da 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 -da. That is necessary to set the boundaries. Sometimes when, when I'm unsure of where, what the camera should do, I'll just say, you rehearse the scene, then let me do my work. Even though I have a mental breakdown right. uh, and it's on paper, it's not working with the location. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to let the location speak to you. And this is not some full fun nonsense. Yeah. You have to let the location speak to you. And sometimes the actors actually do come up with interesting blocking. A lot of times. Yeah. The good actors, for sure. They've seen the whole thing from their POV. They've not seen it from my, uh, you know, detached third person POV. They've seen it from a very emotional first person POV. And that brings with it some beautiful ideas. Because, you know, they've taken the character somewhere and, you you know, you modify it accordingly. So, I agree with Mamet up to a point, but I'm not one of those, no, this is the way I want it. Mm -hmm. I only do it when sometimes the actors are completely on the wrong track. How do you work with actors? The, okay, because a lot of it is done on the audition level and yeah. in uh, when we audition people and you're, uh, when, when I, whatever we worked on, we get a list from the casting director, then we short, then you shortlist a bunch of people. And the last two, three are usually called to the office if they're primary characters, and then you sit and do the reading. Now at that level, three actors on the same level, all they also have the same amount of star power or whatever. What makes you pick one over the other? Like, how, what is a director looking for? And what are you looking for in terms of? I wish I knew. <laughs> is it some, for example, would it be like, uh, how do they take direction? Do they understand my... So, life? instead of being vague, let me try and be uh, a little more articulate about the process. Uh, exactly like you said, the final is short, okay? Then I read with them. Actually, when they are reading, I'm operating the camera, if you remember, for the most part. Because I want to see... and not to get too deep, but I want to look into their eyes without them looking back at me. Mm -hmm. So, which is why I don't read to them because I don't want to be a part of the scene. I want to be uh, the director. I want to be the camera, which is not a part of the scene. All you see me doing, the bulk of the reading is 
you'll see me go tighter and tighter and you know just like frame it there because i'm trying to understand if they are bringing that character i had that i have in my head to life or not a lot of times they've even elevated it i see the act character a certain way and they've just taken it somewhere else i will allow that process to happen in the audition where i just keep looking at that repeatedly and yes after they finish the first take the second and third takes for me are how well do they understand me and that becomes a very very critical point in the process again i have having done this for so long this system is mostly right it's been wrong too and many times it, even after they this process into the audition and on set on set they're just awful and it's like everything else right mm. you have good actors you have mediocre actors you have bad actors you have good directors mediocre directors bad directors so it it happens an audition is what 30 minutes yeah 45 minutes how the hell can you judge someone what as to what they're going to bring to the table in 45 minutes ijaz khan who played wasim khan in city of dreams I cast without meeting him. I cast him. He sent an audition in called him from the states and we had a chat and I just went with my gut. He was a last minute uh, change also. Exactly. We were going to go ahead with someone else exactly. at that point. Exactly. And he ends up being a freaking ace, right? Yeah. In the deck. I mean, my god, you're talking of an actor with like A grade caliber, right? and it happens with me not even spending time with him in the room also while this process is effective one of the things that i try very hard it's the reason why i don't meet actors before i cast an actor i don't meet an actor socially or i don't meet an actor for a cup of coffee there's so much of your personal interaction that comes into play yeah you you like the way i mean there could be attraction you could be attracted to the actor an actor could have all the qualities that you like right in a person which is humility and being friendly an actor could be a total dick there's a level of arrogance and you're like dude i don't like so all these play a part so yeah. that's why i like the the final stage audition process where at least you're trying to mimic the environment on a set mm-hmm. where everything else is blocked out and you're trying to see if it works in that right Yeah so you're trying to see the actors performing the scene correctly because as you always know that the audition is done only f- with scenes from the actual material that's going to be shot so that's happening then i'm giving directions and then i'm seeing how they're going to take the directions and you know what they're going to bring to the table after that so all this i try and mimic the environment of set to the best extent possible and then you sort of it's a coin toss then you go on set And, and hope in the best and hope for the best <laughs> because this process at least it, there, there is something to this there is a level of effort that's put in while the actors being uh, selected that there's a better chance of success than going in completely cold and you know then taking your chances but it's not 100% foolproof and uh, uh, okay so your third film bollywood calling right, right. and you had uh, that was a, probably the first film you had such a senior actor om puri and right, right. act now that's when kind of you started working with like the bigger actors the bigger actors was that challenging as a first time director i mean like a new director were is it easy to like get them to do what you want how do you kind of get them on your team see uh now again in hindsight i can say that an actor is an actor is an actor amount of baggage that they have changes so every actor comes with some baggage but you know when they're starting out and they're like oh this guy is an established director then they're going to hide the baggage and once you know they themselves are famous then they're going to toss the baggage around here and there and everyone else has to cow to it so that's the only difference it Just, eventually does come out yeah i think this being an actor warrants some degree of that having said that uh when i was directing bollywood calling the first day i directed om puri was actually in new jersey he was such a great guy he walked down to set and he said Hey Nagesh, uh, what do you want me to do? I don't know if he directly intended it, but that's the way I took it. That he wanted to tell me that, that is in your hands. Dude, you're the director. Doesn't matter if I'm an established actor. Tell me what you want me to do. And I I never looked back. That was like, oh okay. So, he's an actor. I'm a director. And there's no right or wrong in this business. But that's right? the best case scenario probably you've got, yeah. right? Yeah. And on the other end of the spectrum, 
how do you still kind of hold control because i have like um, uh, seen i like at least when i've tried to direct some stuff i've seen actors like being really difficult and then i just i don't know if i have to be polite i don't know if i have to be like subservient to get them to get the work done or uh, how do you can kind of navigate those cards without while also maintaining hold of your own film you're going to have to find your own way i tell every director this there's no cookie cutter answer what to was your this. way i think people uh, when especially actors when they work with directors they gauge where the director is coming from or or how much does the director know his or her stuff there's a judgment thing going on very clearly when they realize that oh this guy knows his shit and i'm saying he because me this guy knows his stuff then they don't mess around so it goes back to prep again correct yeah. so i've never had those situations i really never have i mean i've had difficult actors mm. but a lot of times the difficulty comes from the fact that they can't give me what i want i i haven't had actors like really come to the set and throw tantrums i mean it's happened once or twice but nothing that i'd say oh i need a different yeah. you know mm. method to handle this it wasn't but clearly it's like you need to let the actor know that you know your stuff yeah that's a good point but so that became a joke right on my sets that actors figure this out once they give an idea no i what i was thinking and i always come back with that's a good idea and they're waiting for the but which <laughs> which means that i don't buy yeah what they're saying so people figure that out so and it's not directly dismissive also exactly yeah so i'm i'm i genuinely i'm never rude to any actor even when i'm casting like a we had 130 odd speaking parts 138 speaking parts in the show that we just did and i watched virtually i'd say maybe not the tertiary actors uh, that i'm comfortable enough for ranjit to pick but i virtually watch every actor's audition because i'll give them that dignity if they put themselves out there and they've auditioned i'll at least watch it sometimes you know 30 seconds into an audition you know they're not on the right track and you move on but i'll at least watch it people who want to get into films do you do uh, like as a directors or writers do you suggest assisting directors or do you suggest try just trying to make your own films and my answer for the last at least 15 years has been the same make your own film because filmmaking has become so cheap i would say write shoot something with your phone and edit it how much money is that going to cost probably nothing correct all is going to it's going to take is your bloody time that's all it's going to take come on that much we need to be able to put in back in the day we could only shoot on film but even if i came to make hyderabad blues in atlanta while i was working as a, a chemical engineer i made a short film on a beta cam but we rented a crew there was another uh, girl who was also a co-producer a co-writer director i'd like to think that i i i did most of the heavy lifting but she was also part of it and we both acted in it and so i cut my teeth on that mm. then i shot a music video i took a couple of actors and i took one guy who could operate just a regular vhs camera mm. and we we went and shot a music video and then i went and sat in an edit studio and i back in the day you had yeah, yeah, you yeah. know those freaking you had to roll it back you had yeah. to roll it back. yeah and i edited that so you you do whatever it takes to learn the craft having said that work on a set because the kind of stuff that you can pick up on a set no amount of reading or even shooting in a living room is going to prepare you for that yeah the madness the fact that you have to work without sleep the fact that you have to shoot unreasonably long hours all this and people skills and people skills you could meet the people if you're shooting alone in a room exactly so i would say do both yeah. but for sure write something shoot it on your phone because there's no way your mind opens up to a new skill i mean you have to go back to the 10000 hour rule right yeah the more you do the better you get at it so do it for sure but if you get a chance to work on a set do it cuz it is the most joyous place to be sometimes you're lucky enough to get material that you believe in and then every day of your life on the set becomes fun and sometimes you're working on a set where the acting is preposterous the script is awful and you still have to you know 
have that same energy and excitement. That's a little bit of a challenge. But you never wanted to assist at any point? Like, did you think of that as an option? Like, I'm going to, I want to come back and work on a film set before I attempt to risk everything I've ever saved. <laughs> I I wanted to. That's what I told you. When I first came... Oh, that, I thought you came to pitch. Oh, no. okay, okay. I um, my In my world, it was the same like everyone else. Back in the day and even now, hmm. I was like, oh, there are filmmakers. Like, I remember ba- uh, back then I thought, oh, Ram Gopal Verma is there. So maybe I'll end up as an AD on his set. Hmm. And then I'll learn, you know, uh, filmmaking and stuff like that. Uh, a friend of mine here knew one Telugu actor, a, a very senior character actor called Balaya. I went to his place and met him. And then he said, I'm shooting this serial, Veer Hanuman. Said, I'm shooting that serial. I know the producer is a very sweet guy. He'll allow you to work on the set. And he said, do you speak Hindi? Because a Telugu crew was shooting a Hindi show. So I said, yeah, I speak Hindi. So he's like, yeah, okay, come to the set. So that scene's there in Bollywood Calling where I showed up. I said, what time do I report? And he said, nine o'clock. I showed up at 9 o'clock. The this crew started arriving at about 10.30 or 11. The producer himself who told me 9 o'clock came at about uh, 12, 15, something like that. And then we broke for lunch. It reminds me of something we worked on. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it it really, uh, that one day on set just opened my eye. I was like, I'm not going to be able to work in this environment. Oh, that was the thing you were show, being shot in Anapurna Studio, that TV show. Okay. That completely, literally that day was, in hindsight, I can say it was, you know, the moment where I had my epiphany. But the truth was, it was my most depressing day. Because I had left everything and come to India. And I was looking at this stuff. And I've done a whole interview of what happened that one day on set. Because it was it was the most devastating thing. And then out of it came Hyderabad Blues. I was like, no. If I'm going to do anything in India using my Indianness, I'm going to have to do my own thing. And I, I think your first three films all have so much of you in it. Yeah. Yeah. Like literally, <laughs> your first three films are all can be a trilogy of your autobiography. I I, I said that um, uh, when I was making Bollywood Calling that um, all the stories came from my diaries. I still maintain a diary. I said with this I'm done now. I better start writing fiction because there's nothing <laughs> else to. Dig from. Yeah, do you have a little view in your character? Like, I don't because I don't see you as Ajaz Khan's character for sure. <laughs> like, keeping doors open. The philosophy is okay. Hundred percent. I mm-hmm. I think you ask any writer this. Mm-hmm. Okay, he or she will put something of themselves into a character. Okay, you will at some level, even if you are writing someone really vile and despicable, in order to be able to get the right words in them, unless you're again. It comes with uh, the level of skill you're talking, skill and experience. If you're writing conditioned by other films and what you watch, then you're going to write that same shit. But if you are writing really like exploring yourself, and that's what I would like to believe that most good writers do, then you're going to bring a lot of you into the character, whether you like it or not. Cool. Take care. So we are done now with this. Uh, Any parting words of wisdom for your Doyle fans? Oh, um, uh, the the three words that I stole from Nike before I made my first film. <laughs> Just do it. That's all. There's no magic to this. There's Just do it. Thank you guys for I watching. Please the... like, share, subscribe. <laughs>